Every weld starts with a joint, and if you don't know what they are or how to put them together properly, you're gonna learn something today. If we had to go back to the basics and you were brand new in welding school, or maybe you're a garage type welder just starting out, weld joints or joint types are probably the most fundamental topic you're gonna learn. A weld joint is how two pieces of material go together to form a specific configuration, and we've only got five. Today, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Using the Canoweld 261M Pro, we're gonna walk you through every single one of these joints. Whether you're a beginner or just brushing up, you're gonna find something useful here. Here, you're looking at Canoweld's 261M Pro Silver Package. Now, this is everything that you would need for stick, and MIG welding. If you want more details on this machine, I would encourage you to go check out our previous video up here. If you want TIG welding, you'd have to purchase the gold package and that will give you everything for all three processes. We're using mild steel coupons, all cut from 3 16 plate. The MIG welder is set up with an 03570S-6 wire and a C5 75% argon, 25% CO2. Our settings are between 19 and 21 volts and 280 to 325 inches per minute on that wire feed. So keep in mind, this machine has synergic control. So if you're going around aimlessly looking for settings, this machine will give you a pretty close range. But if you're a seasoned welder with a ton of experience, maybe you don't want to use that. You can just go back to the regular standard MIG settings. Now, before we get welding, let's have a look at our basic weld joints. Number one is our butt joint. This is where two pieces of material come together to form a butt weld, normally associated with groove welds. Depending on the material thickness, you may require edge preparation. Number two is your corner joint. This is where two pieces of material go together at their edges, often forming a 90 degree angle. Generally associated with fillet welds, this can be an outside corner or an inside corner. Number three is your famous T-joint. This is where two pieces of material go together perpendicular to each other to form a 90 degree angle, generally associated with fillet welds. Number four seems to be less common but still used and considered a weld joint, and this is your edge joint. This is where two pieces of material are overlapped and the edge is welded. Number five is your lap joint. This is where two pieces of material parallel overlap each other to form a 90 degree weld joint. Associated with fillet welds, this is probably one of the more common weld joints. If you're practicing weld joints, we'll often put together a number of joint configurations to form this little assembly. Now, although practice welds are not typical of what you would see, you would normally see more than six inches of weld in the field. However, this is a good starting point. This allows you to practice without wasting too much material. They give you the opportunity to run multiple beads, troubleshoot, and improve your consistency without burning through too much material. Now, as mentioned earlier, weld joints fall under one of five different types. You got your butt, you got your corner, you got your T, you got your edge, and you got your lap joint. I like to use the acronym BCTEL to remember all of these. Now, we're going to use this pile of coupons here to tack up an example for one of each. Now, just a little side note, a coupon refers to a piece or sometimes a few pieces of metal used for welding practice or testing. They form the basic joint configuration you're working on. All right, it's a bit louder in here. I got my machine on right now and set 7525 for shielding gas. And I'm on the synergic mode. So I've got my machine set for 3 16 material. There's a bit of mill scale on here. I'm not going to grind too hard on this. We're just going to go at it. So we're starting with the butt joint. I've decided to give myself a little bevel on that. That's just to open up that groove for us. And 3 16 is usually about the maximum thickness you wanna go without joint prep on this. So anything lower than that, you can just butt it up together and put a pass over top. Even set yourself a little gap. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. Set myself a little gap, give myself some tacks, and then we're gonna weld this together. All right, with everything cleaned, wire brushed, and tacked up, we can jump right into these welds. I'm dosing these with a spatter spray, which will help remove any unwanted spatter later on. Now, even though these are just practice welds, 
If you're learning, if you're brand new, if you're getting ready for a weld test, our buddy Jason Becker at the Arc Junkies podcast says this, treat every single weld like it's gonna be tested, like it's gonna be destructive or even x-ray tested. Then down the road, you don't have anything to worry about. This means paying attention to cleaning up your material, chipping slag off properly, watching the toes of that weld, and just really taking your time. BC tell, let's start with that butt joint. This is where two pieces of plate are joined edge to edge in the same plane. I'm putting a small bevel on this plate and leaving a small root gap to help with penetration. Generally speaking, anything smaller than 3 16 doesn't normally require a bevel, but I like to use one so that the weld has something nice to sit in. This will give us a nice flat weld. We're just focusing on a single pass weld here. Depending on the thickness and the size of that groove, I might drag that first pass. It's said to have slightly more penetration. However, for thinner plate, you might be better off pushing. For thin plate, keep a slight push angle, around 10 to 15 degrees, and keep the wire at the leading edge of the puddle. You want a steady travel speed. Watch the puddle bite the top edge of the bevel on each side. A nice, crisp, clean, short circuit sound tells us that you're dialed in just right. Having a look at our finished product on this one, we ended up welding both sides of the joint. One side we pushed the puddle, the other side we dragged it. You can see where we dragged the puddle, we're slightly higher and more crowned up. Whereas this side here where we pushed, we've got a slightly flatter weld. Number two is our corner joint and we're focusing on the outside of that groove. This one's super common in sheet metal where you've got two pieces of material coming together to form a 90 degree or an L shape and we weld that little joint. With 3 16 we've got enough material to run a solid fillet, hold a 45 degree gun angle pointing into the center of the joint, and keep your wire right at the root. A consistent travel speed with a slight push angle between zero and 15 degrees will produce a nice flat bead that's not too crowned up. Watch that you're just biting the edges of the groove, just like we did with the butt joint. We don't want underfilled joint or an oversized weld. You're looking for even leg lengths and smooth reinforcement. No undercut or excessive buildup. Once again, checking out our finished product, you can see that I don't have a great deal of undercut or any overlap and that weld is nice and centered. A common mistake here is to have uneven fit up, producing a weld that is favored on one side or the other. Remember to keep that centered, keep that fit up almost next to perfect, and you'll have a good weld. All right, we're moving on to the T-joint. I like to turn my settings up a little bit on this because it has more surface area. I find if we keep the same settings as our outside corner, you might come in a little bit cold and it'll produce some overlap or some lack of fusion. Again, I'm using a 45 degree gun angle and focusing the arc into the corner. A slight push angle between zero and 15 degrees with MIG on 3 16 will produce solid penetration with a single pass. Just watch your travel speed and keep your wire centered. Watch the toes of the weld and make sure you're not undercutting the top edge. A common mistake on this is to have uneven legs. This is caused from focusing too much of the heat on the top or the bottom plate. Now you might be asking yourself what the weld size should be if it's not given on a drawing or a blueprint. Now a general rule of thumb is to go with the smallest thickness of material. In this case here we have two pieces of 3 16 plate going together. That means that our weld size should be 3 16 of an inch. Now if you have dissimilar material thicknesses going together, you're going to favor the smallest thickness. If you have 3 16 and 3 8 going together, that weld size should be 3 16 our next one is our edge joint, and this one's a lot less common than some of our other weld joints. The edge of that plate is welded and oftentimes is ground down so we don't see it for cosmetic reasons. This joint doesn't have much material to work with, so we're running a lower heat input and moving quick to avoid burning through. I'm using a tight stringer bead and moving a little bit faster to avoid any sort of burn through. You want a small, neat weld with minimal spatter. On thicker material like this, the weld will mostly sit on top with partial penetration, which is fine for non-critical applications. Looking at our finished product, you can see that we're not very centered, but this would get ground down and it'll look nice and clean once finished. All right, finally, we're on our last one and that's the lap joint. And that's probably one of the most common weld joints, but when mastered, it's very satisfying. One plate overlaps another and we weld along that edge where they meet. This is super common in automotive, trailer fabrication, and even structural work. I'm using a zero to 15 degree push angle pointing slightly at that bottom plate. Most of your heat should go pointed to the thicker plate. My trick is to come off the groove slightly, 
about a 32nd of an inch and I watch the metal wash up onto that top member. You want to bite the edge like you would on the groove and corner joint. Once again, I'm running a straight stringer pass. You want to watch the edges and keep the beads centered over that seam. This one is all about fusion and a clean tie in on both edges. All right, here's our finished product. We're looking at the toes of the weld again. The bottom looks nice. We're nice and washed in. We're relatively flat. We're not crowned up and we don't have a whole bunch of undercut. Now, if you look closely, you can see the edge of that plate on the top and that's slightly underfilled. Now, a common mistake is to either underfill this excessively or we end up undercutting that top edge because we're traveling too slow. It's really important to have good fit up on this joint no big gaps and a nice tight fit up on those edges. You want to overlap between three eighths and half of an inch. You don't want to overlap it too much where you don't have enough of a heat sink on that bottom plate. This will cause that weld to overheat prematurely and cause some undercut or other weld faults. There you have it everybody. That was your five basic weld joints with that MIG process using the Cano Weld. 261M Pro. Practicing on short coupons like these ones is the best way to develop your technique, especially if you're prepping for a weld test or job site work. Let's recap. Butt joints associated with groove welds where maximum penetration is needed. Corner joints, great for fabrication and sheet metal work. T joints, structural and probably one of the more common joints. Edge joint, good for cosmetic and light duty work. And finally, your lap joint, Probably another one of the more common ones for high strength, all around general fabrication and structural work. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. And if you did, please hit the like and subscribe button. Drop me a comment. Let me know which joint you're working on or which one you're struggling with. There's more welding content to come. So keep those lenses clean and we'll catch you on the next one.